it's hard to grasp this, but you know, I was 23 and I controlled the launch of three nuclear missiles. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Good evening. The stunning overthrow of Mikhail Gorbachev by communist hardliners dominates the news this Monday. The Chinese army, the Chinese police are advancing through the city from a variety of directions on Tiananmen Square. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Scott was a Pershing II nuclear missile fire control officer, which meant he was responsible for the launch of the missile. Age 23, he was made a platoon commander and responsible for three of these deadly weapons. The Pershing II was a mobile intermediate-range ballistic missile deployed by the US Army at American bases in West Germany at the start of 1983. It was aimed at targets in the Western Soviet Union, with each Pershing carrying a single thermonuclear warhead with the explosive force of 5 to 50 kilotons of TNT. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a written review in Apple Podcasts or share us on social media by telling your friends you can really help the podcast grow. If you can spare it, I'm asking listeners to contribute at least three US dollars per month to help keep us on the air. Plus, you get the sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a monthly financial supporter and you bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping preserve Cold War history. You also get some exclusive extras as well. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So back to today's episode. Guest host Peter Ryan chatted with Scott and you will remember Peter from episode 101 where he interviewed me about the podcast. We welcome Scott and Peter to our Cold War Conversation. Probably a good starting point for our discussion today would be if you could tell me just a little bit about your background and what led you to join the U.S. military. Yeah, sure. So, so I grew up in a military family. Uh, my father was in the Army. Uh, he was a field artillery officer. Uh, and so that was just sort of part of you know, the way I grew up, I guess. Um, now, he was in the National Guard, uh, so he was never on active duty, but yet um, again, you know, he was, you know, as they call a weekend warrior, but, uh, but uh, he spent 28 years, 29 years doing that. And so that was just, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, associated with that. And so, you know, when it came time for me to make a decision, what I wanted to do after high school, um, you know, kind of going in the army, it sort of seemed like a natural thing for me. Um, I was really fortunate, uh, to earn a, a four year, a scholar ROTC scholarship. Uh, that's that's pretty prestigious, to be real honest with you. I mean, it, and so I had a full ride for four years. I mean, all books, tuitions. Uh, you know, they paid me a stipend every month. I mean, all I had to do was I had a you know, one ROTC class each semester, and then I had to commit to going on active duty for four years after I graduated from college. But but at the time, you know, that seemed to me like a great opportunity because it was something I was really interested in doing. So. You know, at the, at the point I'm about to graduate and you list your preferences for what branch do you want and where do you want to go? I picked field artillery and I picked Germany and that lined up perfectly with what they were doing with the new Pershing II weapon system that was being deployed. And so there I go. So, so I, uh, I, I graduated from college and they shipped me off to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is the, the field artillery school. Um, went through my field artillery officer basic course, which was... 10 or 12 weeks, I suppose. And then towards the end, we all got our orders for our follow on courses to based upon what our specialty was going to be. And, um, and they, they sent me to the Pershing officer course, which was a, uh, a follow on course. And all of us that were going, we all kind of looked at each other, like, what the heck is that? We really, as, as we were studying, you know, artillery systems and such during our basic course, there was not a lot of attention paid to the whole Pershing system just because, it's sort of an anomaly within the field artillery uh, weaponry. Um, but that was just as they were about to deploy the Pershing II 
system. And so they were trying to snatch up as many, uh, you know, brand new lieutenants in the field artillery who were going to Germany so they could uh, put us in the Pershing units, which were being the Pershing two units, which were being stood up. Great stuff. So that's really interesting. I'd be curious, Scott, can you tell us a little bit about from the standpoint of when you were deployed to Germany, when you got off the plane, what were your first impressions of the country? Man, it is awesome. I, I love Germany. Uh, uh, I mean, I've been back several times. Frankly, we've had a trip planned for this fall to go back because my, my, my wife has never been there. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I've traveled all over Europe. And I'll be honest with you, to me, it's, it's my favorite place over there. It's, it's, it's interesting because I think when people sort of think about going to Europe, you know, they think about France or they think about Italy or they think about going to the UK or, or you know, I mean, Germany in, in many cases is not on somebody's short list. To me, it is it is the best place to go. I mean, it's, it's incredibly beautiful there. It's incredibly clean there. The people are super nice. The food is incredible. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I had never, this is shocking that I graduated from college and I'm about to tell you this, but I had never drank beer or coffee before going to Germany. <laughs> And, and those are two things that they really do well. So, I mean, it, it's just, I love the country. And, and like I said, I've been back several times. I'm going again this fall. It, it's, it's an incredibly wonderful place. Well, that's fantastic. Now, which part of Germany did you land in? Which part were you stationed in? So I lived in, um, so the, the battalion I was a part of was in Ulm, Germany, U-L-M, mm -hmm. Ulm, Germany, which is sort of mid, it's right on the Donau River, the Danube, as we call it, the Danube River, sort of midway between yeah. Stuttgart and Munich. So mm -hmm. down in the heart of Bavaria, uh, Baden-Württemberg area, very close to, uh, I mean, you know, I could make it to Austria or Switzerland in an hour, hour and 15 minutes. So we could ski every weekend. Very, very nice. I'm curious in terms of prior to arriving or even after maybe when you did arrive, what briefings were you given about the East Germany, about the GDR? What were you what were you informed? What were you told to watch out for? Oh, yeah. I mean, we weren't allowed to have anything to do with it. I mean, a lot. Of, um, I mean, this is obviously the height of the Cold War. I'm working with a, a, a nuclear weapon system. I've got a top secret clearance. I actually had a cosmic top secret, a Tommel clearance, which means I even have a had a higher level of access than just basic top secret. Uh, and, and the Pershing two was, um, it, it scared the heck out of the, uh, out of the Soviets, to be honest with you. I mean, ultimately that's what ended the cold war was, was, was the, the ground launch cruise missile and the Pershing two. But, but so, so we were certainly briefed about, uh, uh, the fact that they were interested in us. Uh, we were briefed on what to talk about and what not to talk about. We were briefed about, you know, how you avoided you know, the, the kinds of contact to avoid with people. You know, we were briefed on the fact that the Spetsnaz, which were sort of the, the Soviets kind of version of, uh, you know, our, our special forces guys. I mean, those were the folks that, you know, we, we would, um, you know, those were the folks that were, that were trailing us and paying attention to us and that we, you know, that, you know, we, we, were, we, we, we were to be on our guard. We certainly were absolutely not allowed to cross the border. Uh, you know, there were other folks that were over there in Germany at the time I was there that were allowed to cross the border and go over into over to Berlin. But, but we were absolutely prevented from, from doing that at all. So you're, from what you're saying, you were aware that there were points where you were being followed or observed by people oh, yeah. who were from the East Bloc? No question. I mean, we can you we tell were, us, we, tell us a little we bit were, about that, we were to us we were to assume that they were always watching us. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, that was just that was just a way of life. I mean, you know, particularly if you're an officer and you're working with the Pershings, you're, you're probably of interest to them. And then you know, we were we were told to, to about the things that you know that, that that cause interest. You know, getting you drunk and taking your advantage. You know, getting information from you that way. Women who might have an interest in you to get information from you. I mean, all of those things. I mean, we were fully aware of. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, every every time we so we, we, we would deploy to the field uh, a lot. I mean, and every time we left the gates, I mean, you know, theoretically, we were going to war, right? I mean, that, that was, that's the thing that people have a hard time understanding is, I mean, all of my colleagues who were over there who were doing other, you know, normal sort of army stuff, um, I mean, they were going exercises, but unless they went to a training area where they were shooting live ammo, I mean, they were just practicing. I mean, for mm -hmm. us, every time we rolled out the gate, we were going to war. And so, um, so, so it, it, it's hard to imagine that, but, but that was truly the case. And, and the interesting thing about it was that, I mean, it, it, so, so I, 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 I uh, you know, I would generally lead the convoys for my 
my platoon. And so, you know, you'd have a Pulitz eye escort in front of you. You'd mm-hmm. have your whole convoy, which was uh, probably 20 ish vehicles. You'd have a Pulitz eye at the end of your convoy. And then you'd have all the, the string of vehicles, which was all the protesters that would be then be following them. And we knew intermixed in amongst those protesters were, were most likely Soviet agents. And so, you know, we'd go occupy our position out in the woods someplace and we'd set up our perimeter. And depending upon where we were in which state in Germany we were setting up, the level of support from the Pulitz eye and the local government varied. In some cases, they were very supportive. And in some cases, they didn't do anything at all. But, but in most cases, in a lot of cases, again, depending upon where we were going, we would have protesters who would be outside of our perimeter. And in some cases, they were pretty passive. And in some cases, they were very aggressive. Okay, interesting. Scott, how close did you get to the border with the GDR when you were in Germany? So here's the thing. <laughs> the, what, the, when the balloon went up, if you will, all of the traditional infantry, armor, artillery guys, they were heading east toward the border. For us, you know, when the balloon went up, if you will, all of our firing positions were to the west. So we actually headed towards France, Belgium, uh, because all of our all of our wartime firing positions were actually to the west. So um, that sort of ran counter to what everybody else was doing and going to the front. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. So tell me a little bit about Pershing II and how it worked. I'd be curious if you could give an overview about what uh, the role of somebody like yourself would be responsible for in terms of the, the operation and maintenance of this technology. Yeah, I mean it was, it was it's incredible. Um, just and, and think and if you think about it, so uh, so the way so so the way that a Pershing um, firing battery was structured, so they actually um, elevated the levels of responsibility and requirements within a Pershing organization, such that in a typical artillery battery, you've got a captain that's a battery commander and a lieutenant that's a, a platoon leader. Um, mm-hmm. In Pershing. Um, captains were platoon leaders and majors were battery commanders because it was, you know, I mean, it's, it was extensively, significantly more responsibility. Uh, I mean, in a, in a firing battery, you had nine nuclear missiles. So, um, so they, so they elevated the, the level of responsibility. I'll, and I'll tell you, it didn't, it, it did not go over real well with a lot of those captains who had been battery commanders and then came over there to go to become a platoon leader. Um, but, but, but people, but, you know, it, it was difficult for them to really understand that you know, sort of coming from the outside. But, but I went over there. I mean, it was my first assignment. I went over there uh, straight out of paratrooper school and I was a second Lieutenant. And so uh, I was assigned as a fire control officer. So I, so the fire control officer sat inside of a, of a, the, the back of a, of a hut on the back of a five ton truck. And that's where we controlled the launch of the three missiles that were in our platoon. Um, and then uh, over the so there was generally me and an NCO in there and a couple of other enlisted guys. Um, and, and so at the time we got the launch codes, we would you know, decipher the codes, open the safe and pull out the keys. And we were responsible for doing the launch over the course of the time I was there. I got promoted to a first lieutenant and I actually ended up becoming a platoon commander. So I had um, I had I commanded a, a, a Pershing platoon. Uh, and so I had, you know, significantly more responsibility, but I tell people, I mean, it's, it's hard to grasp this, but you know, I was 23 and I controlled the launch of three nuclear missiles. I mean, so, so as I've gone through my life, you know, and I've, I've been on interviews or whatever, and people have asked me, how do you deal with pressure and stress? I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, I was 23 and I controlled three nuclear missiles. So, so it was, it was, it was, it was incredible. Um, the, the missile system itself and the reason that, um, it was of such significance to, really ending the cold war was the fact that first of all it was able to it was able to um travel far enough that it could hit the soviet union the p1a while it um delivered a nuclear yield it did not have the ability to hit the soviet union it could hit the uh, or to hit russia it could hit the the other eastern bloc countries that were to the west of the soviet union poland bulgaria etc but the p2 was actually the first one that that within 11 minutes could hit the motherland. Secondly, because of the fact that we were um, so stealth and they, I mean, they, they literally had no idea where we were. So that was why these Spetsnaz agents, I mean, their job was to go find us when we were out hiding in the woods. And that was really what we did was we would, you know, we'd go set up a position in the, in the woods someplace and just power everything down and sit and hide. 
And then nightfall would hit and we'd crank everything up and go move, you know, 50, 75 kilometers and set up a new position and, and go hide there. So, uh, but, but th- so their mission was to go find us and our mission was to go hide from them. Uh, so, so, but we also had, um, so the way, so the way that the Pershing system, so, so there were three battalions over there. Uh, each battalion's got four batteries. Each battery's got uh, uh, nine missiles. And so, um, and then each of those battalions had a fixed missile site where you always had nine missiles sitting ready to launch. And then one of the other batteries in that battalion would be hiding out in the woods someplace. So, uh, so the missiles that were at the site that were ready to launch, I mean, those were, those were always, I mean, that was sort of a show of force on our part to be real honest with you. Uh, I mean, we just wanted them to know that at any given time, you've got 27 nuclear miss tactical nuclear missiles that can hit you guys within 11 minutes. Uh, and, and so, so that was, that was a part of the whole nuclear deterrence mission for us, which we had the you know, 27 missiles on fixed sites and then everybody else was out hiding in the woods. So it, it's interesting when you were describing the, the order to launch process, I, I know that we've seen these types of scenarios played out in different movies or television shows. The one that comes to mind immediately is War Games from 1983. How realistic would a scenario like that in popular culture be relative to somebody who was actually on the front lines and had to deal with that type of a decision, as you say, which was immensely, uh, immensely stressful and put a lot of pressure on you? Yeah, people people don't understand this, but but literally, I mean, so we would get at the platoon level, you know, so you know, so where you've got, uh, you know, your your three missiles at the platoon level, we had direct communication with the United States Army Europe headquarters. So there, you know, there was no filtering through channels. We had direct communication with the United States Army Europe headquarters, and they were the ones who who you know sent us our our missions. Um, and so, uh, you know, we would get a, a coded message down uh, and we had code books that we used to decode the message and that had the launch codes in it. And um, and so depending upon what that message was, once we uh, once we you know, deciphered the message, uh, if it required us to. So the keys were kept in a safe that were under two man control. So I had one half of the combination. My NCO in charge had the other half of the combination. And if we had, a, if we received a message that required us to, uh, you know, and obviously these are uh, test launches that we're doing, right? We, I, I never received an actual message to do a real launch, of course, but but we would receive messages that would that would tell us to prepare to launch, and 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 so so you know we would each of us open up our half of the safe, open up the safe. We each had a set of keys, and when uh, when we got to the point in the countdown where we were to launch, we would each turn our key to the right in the in the panel there the, the computer that we used and and that would you know that would launch the missile uh, so we we did practice we practiced that a lot and um and the reality of it is i mean you know every time the siren went off every time you got a message i mean you didn't know if it was the real thing or not i mean you know we were all hopeful it wasn't the real thing but you never really knew well this is true and, in th- and then theoretically i mean we both you know when we were in that van um in the back of that, you know, in that hut in the back of the truck, or if we were at the missile site and we were, we were in the launch control launch center there. I mean, you know, you never knew we each had a sidearm on and, you know, if you got to the point where you're supposed to open the safe and, and launch the missiles, if the other guy wouldn't do it, I mean, that's why you had the sidearm. So, um, you know, I mean, so, so it's very realistic. I mean, I've, you know, I've told people that story before and they're like, so you're supposed to shoot them. I'm like, well, if they aren't going to launch the missiles and that's the message you've been given. Yep. That's what you're supposed to do. So, yeah. I have to say that that start of, of the movie War Games that we referred to earlier, where that's exactly what happens, where Michael Madsen has to pull his sidearm out on John Spencer, it still gives me chills to this day, knowing that there is a great deal of reality and, and realism. That's exactly, I mean, that was, that was, I spent three years doing that. Yeah, no, fascinating. Now, Scott, tell me, how often did you go out on these exercises? What would the frequency be? Was there was there a set schedule, or was it done at the behest of, of what the Pentagon would order, uh, per- perhaps just to, to, to keep everything random? So here's the way it worked. So the missile site, so in, in, in a battalion, you've got four firing batteries, and so each battery was out at the missile site for three months at a time. 
So, so I mean, and the missile sites were, I mean, you had barracks and you had a gym and you had a, you know, a dining facility and there was a chapel there and you know, there was a maintenance facility. And so it was, you know, you were, I mean, we were there for three months. Now we would get, uh, we would have the opportunity to work, you know, maybe four or five days on, a couple of days off, four or five days on, a couple of days off, but, but, and families could come out and visit on the weekends, but, but we were there three months. Um, so that would just rotate it between batteries, right? So you knew, you knew when you were going to be out on site, you were going to be there for three months. Now, during the other nine months, um, the way it was broken down was you had, uh, you had about three months where you were in a maintenance phase where you were just making sure every single thing you had, you know, was ma- was maintained and updated perfectly. I mean, we would go through these inspections that it was, it was insane. I mean, I mean, literally, if you think about, you know, you've got three nuclear missiles in all of the pieces and parts of all of that, you know, I mean, I mean, all that stuff would be taken completely apart and we would have these inspection teams that came down from, from the department of the army. I'm not talking about somebody from the battalion headquarters. I mean, we had inspectors from the department of the army, the department of defense that would come down to inspect us. I mean, every single bolt, I mean, if something had to be torqued, they would measure the amount of torque on the bolt. I mean, it was, so we spent three months doing that. And then the, and then the other two months we were out in the field. So, I mean, we'd go out for 10 days in the field. We'd come back for a week or 10 days, go back out for 10 days, come back in for 10 days. And so that went on generally for the other six months of the year. So assuming that you were given the order to fire, what were your orders once the missiles had been launched? What were you supposed to do at that point? So if we were out in the field, um, it was haul ass and get out of there. Uh, and, 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 and because we knew, I mean, we, we knew the second those missiles took off, they were tracking them. They knew where they were coming from and we'd have missiles coming back at us. Right. So, so literally our, if we were out in the field and again, remember I told you that our, our wartime firing positions were, you know, were, were to the Western part of Germany. And so, I mean, the, the, the I mean, the, the mission was displace and get out of there and get out of there fast. I mean, if we were at the missile site, um, I mean, we knew we probably didn't have much hope. Uh, I mean, frankly, there was a German Air Force base near our missile site, and their F-4s would fly over periodically practicing their bombing runs when they were because their mission was to destroy the site. So, so we knew if we were on the site and we launched the missiles, I mean, it was the same exact thing. Get out of there as fast as you can because we knew the Germans would be coming in behind it to blow up the site. So, um, so, so it's all, you know, you, you think about it, you know, I think back because it's been a long time ago, but you, you think, geez, that's crazy stuff that we were living. But that was that was the reality of it is that's uh, kind of what we planned for all the time. And what what steps were taken to defend the, the missile sites? What what was being done in terms of making sure that uh, that they were watertight, that people couldn't get near them, whether it was protesters or or perhaps uh, people involved in espionage? What were the defense mechanisms like in, in the perimeters? Yeah, so so the the missile site itself had uh, had uh, double fences with with barbed wire on top of them, and then there were there were uh, uh, towers around there that that we had. Uh, so we would, so if you were in a field, so you know, the Pershing is a, is a field artillery system. And so all of my guys were field artillery MOSs, but we also had an infantry battalion assigned to us as well. And those were the guys that provided the security. So when we were out at our missile site, uh, the, the infantry guys pulled, pulled guard duty in the towers. Uh, and so we had, you know, they had machine gunners up in the towers. Um, you know, there was double fencing with about a eight or 10 feet between the two rows of fencing, both of them, you know, they had barbed wire on top of them and they were just, you know, manned 24 hours. I'll tell you, this is something sort of funny. They did a test with our missile site. There was a period of time where we actually at our missile site in between the two rows of fences, we had guard geese and they they deployed geese in in the exclusion area between the two rows of uh, fences because I guess they would, if somebody approached the fence, they'd start cackling or whatever. And so they would, you know, may, raise awareness to the guys in the, that were, that were guarding the perimeter that there was somebody out there. So I thought that was kind of funny, but so, yeah. so, so we had, so, so that, so there's double fencing around the entire missile site. And then to get down into the launch area, um, there was double fencing there. Uh, and then there was a, a, a gate that you had to go through. Um, through security at the gate because at the missile sites um, not only did we have 
you know, missiles there ready to launch, but there was also um, storage facility there to store warheads too. So, um, uh, so and, and we would do funny games with the, the warheads and, and the movement of those things. Well, so here's the thing. So we, so the other thing we knew is we knew that the Soviets were doing, were doing flyovers and taking pictures of the, of the sites. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we had, um, we knew when those were scheduled to be. So what, what we would do is so like at our site, I don't remember, there were probably, um, nine bunkers where there were, there were warheads stored, but of those nine bunkers, only three of them would have warheads in them. So we would run out there and during the periods of time when, they weren't scheduled to do a flyover. We very quickly moved the warheads around, uh, so they would never know in which bunker the warheads were. But um, but so but the security was. I mean, at the end of the day, it was it was, you know, for, I mean, our threat was was uh, you know special operators trying to get onto the site. I mean, you know, we weren't worried about having a tank roll up on us or anything, right? Uh, or or obviously the threat of uh, of one of their tactical nukes coming back at us. But but. But given the the what we what we perceived to be the immediate threat to be, I mean, we had where the missiles were. There was double fence with security, another double fence with security. So we we felt pretty secure that we didn't have any issues with you know having somebody infiltrate the site. Now they would appear, like sometimes there'd be protesters that would show up and they'd uh -huh. you know, march around the outside of the perimeter or what have you. But they, you know they they were. They really didn't bug us too much. Now, when we went to the field and we were out in the woods, different story. But on our on the missile sites, it was uh, we knew we didn't really have much to worry about out there. So, thinking about your time when you weren't on duty, when you were off duty on Smarnar, what were some of the things that you enjoyed doing in Germany? What were some of the the more fun activities that you were able to take advantage of when you were overseas? Yeah, I mean, so I so I said where, where I lived. I mean, you know, we could be to the Alps in an hour and a half, easy. So I mean, so there on our concern, they had uh, bus trips to go skiing on the weekends. So I, I had never skied either before I went over there. So I learned to ski, and we would ski a lot. Uh, you know, in the summertime, there's there's lots of lakes around, and then you know, windsurfing was kind of popular back then. Uh, I mean, we would just try to relax as much as we could because I mean that that was an incredibly high stress environment. I mean, I get maybe, I mean, the old, the older, you know, the NCOs and, and, and the warrant officers who'd been around a long time. I mean, I, maybe they, maybe it impacted them more than me. I mean, I was 23, 24. This was all I knew. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe I didn't realize how stressful it was compared to the guys who'd been around for 15 or 16 years, because that, that was what I knew to, that was all I knew, but, but we certainly tried to, um, and there was a lot of, um, you know, I mean, that's the, that's, that's the, to me, that's one of the best things about the military. I mean, I, I spent 28 years in the military. I, the, um, so after I left there, I decided to obviously stay. And, 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 you know, the, I mean, you, you talk about it and it sounds cliche, but the, the teamwork and the camaraderie, um, is, is a real thing. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when we, we, you know, we would have family picnics and get togethers and cookouts. I mean, everybody really, uh, um, I mean, we worked really closely together and we worked really hard and we were under a lot of pressure and, and we were gone a lot. And so, so there, there was, there, there literally was a lot of, of camaraderie and teamwork and family time. But, but Germany was, I mean, the, the, I mean, you know, the nice thing about being in Germany, I mean, you're sort of in central Europe there. I mean, you know, if you had a long weekend, you could go to Italy. That was back in the days when Yugoslavia still existed. I mean, I remember one weekend we drove to Yugoslavia, you go to France, you go to, you know, it'd be all over the place, uh, traveling. Um, if you had you know, three or four days, so it did a lot of that too. Yeah, that's a beautiful part about Europe, and I, I remember that from my when I lived in Europe about 15, 20 years ago. You could literally go to places you'd be reading about uh, when you were a kid that you just yeah. thought was so inaccessible, and you can get there in less than an hour in many cases. Well, and and, and they did a good job on the concern of putting together. I mean, I like you know I'm not a big fan of you know group trips and stuff, but we I did do a you know, a, like a bus tour to, to France one weekend, you know, and I mean, th those things were all available and really inexpensive. I mean, it was all sponsored by, it was all through there on post and through the morale welfare, uh, so was, you know, the, the organization that helped to plan all those kinds of things for us. And so they, they really did a good job of, of planning activities to help people go de-stress and go experience Europe. And so there was, there were, there were lots of opportunities to do those kinds of things. And they did a really good job of it. 
So tell me, just to, to finish off on this section of the interview, what did you like most about your job or your role when you were in Germany? Um, you weren't practicing. I mean, it was the real thing, you know. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, there are some people who spend an entire career in the military and and you know never get to go, you know, really do anything but practice. Uh, and, and 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 you know, literally every time we rolled out the gate. You know, we were we were in effect going to war, but we never knew you know when the real you know launch codes were com- coming down and we were you know, really launching missiles. I mean, so it, it was so again, I was really young and it was my first job I ever had, other than you know working at the mall at a clothing store or something. It was the first real job I ever had, and, and it, um, you know, I just I learned a lot and um, worked with some really great people and uh, had tremendous experiences and. Um, I mean, I look back. I, I look back on it. It was an it was an incredible opportunity, uh, and it was just a, it was an incredible experience. It, it really was. Oh, that's fantastic! And, and thanks for sharing some of your experiences with us. I, I'd like to move now to our our fun section. Not that the other part hasn't been fun, but this is more uh, a quick fire portion of the discussion where we take into account a little bit about your experience and how that might influence your views on elements around popular culture. So maybe to kick off, Scott, can you tell us what's your favorite movie about the Cold War or the, your favorite movie set in the Cold War? I really like Hunt for Red October. Um, that, that's a really good one. Uh, War Games, of course, you've got to like that one. Um, you know, I've always been um, – uh, I, I grew up watching, you know, war movies. <laughs> so, yeah. so I've always watched a lot of those. You know, we were big fans of John Wayne, you know, when I was a kid and, and watching all those World War II movies. And so, um, so I, you know, I, I still continue to, to seek those out, but I, I do, I really do like Hunt for Red October probably and Morgan. So those are probably both very cliche as well, but you know, it's, uh, they're, they're pretty good portrayals. No, I don't appreciate That's the thing that people really, I mean, it's hard to, to really represent to somebody what, what it's really like when, I mean, when you're out there and what you're doing, you know, it, you're not playing. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and, and just like the example of, you know, we both have a sidearm on and we both have, you know, access to the safe and we both have the launch codes and, you know, we both have to do our job or somebody can, is going to get hurt. And it's just, you know, that's, that was reality for me. And, you know, like you said, you see it in a movie and it's hard to realize that that's the real stuff, you know? Well, this is it. You know, nobody can really understand, I, I think, unless they've been in that position. And obviously you have, and, you know, you've got a good sense about what that would be like. I, I have to say that uh, your choice about the Hunt for Red October, I think, is an excellent one. To my mind, it's probably one of the best Cold War movies I've seen. I, I love the fact that it's submarine based because I really enjoy submarine movies. And I, I think that Ian Sanders, the, the perennial host of Cold War Conversations, would list that amongst his favorite to as well so you're in good company yeah i mean it's just it's a great portrayal of the the whole cat and mouse game and just it's uh it's yeah i really like it a lot great actors and great yeah it's just really really good so in terms of your time in germany if you could think of a couple of songs that would be part of your soundtrack to your period over there to your experiences in germany do any songs come to mind any pieces of music that that resonate with you well, so not so. Here's the thing. I mean, one of the so you asked me about what I enjoyed doing while I was over there, and something I missed that I think you got to really think about is is I mean, the German culture. I love the German culture, and they and and they're just you know they're just a happy people, right? But they yeah. have all those they have all those festivals and with the beer tents and and you know everybody think everybody thinks about Munich and Oktoberfest, but I frankly I never even went to to the Oktoberfest. But every little village has their little festival, and and and. And, you know, they've got that music playing. That's that. I mean, this it's again, it's, it's that typical German oompa music that you think about yeah. hearing at those festivals. And that, to me, I mean, really represents you know what, what was so part of the fun about being there was just that whole experiencing the German culture. I mean, I became very good friends with a with a, a German couple while I was there. I mean, like best friends, and and so they were able to really help me see you know, part of that German culture that maybe other guys that I knew weren't able to experience because 
frankly, he happened to be a German police officer. So he really had access to pretty much whatever he wanted. And so I got, I really got to experience the culture sort of behind the scenes and, and those festivals and the, the music and the beer tents and the food and just all that, that the smells. And it, that to me is really representative of, of, you know, sort of the, the, the fun part of that culture that I experienced. Do you still keep in touch with that couple? I do. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, his friendships I mean, have lasted a lifetime. Frankly, their son, I, I'm the, I'm the godfather of their son. Um, wow. and so when I, when we go back over there this fall to visit, I'll, I'll see them, you know, while we're there. But I think Scott, that raises an interesting point too. And, and I'd like to touch on this just really quickly as an aside in general terms, how were U S service people received by uh, the German citizens, by the West German citizens when you were stationed over there? Was it a warm welcome? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. You had your handful of, of, of protesters who didn't like us being there. But the reality of it is, I mean, they all realized, you know, at the time I was there, we had 250,000 soldiers there. And what were we doing? We were protecting them. So, yeah. so they were incredibly warm and incredibly friendly. And, and, you know, I learned enough German to be dangerous, but it always, you know, if you'd start out trying to speak German with them, they'd always speak English back to you. And, and it was just, no, it was, it was, I could not fully describe for you just how warm, friendly those people were and how welcoming they were. It was, it was, it was incredible. Uh, that's great. Uh, tell me, did you collect anything over there uh, related to your time as a serviceman or, or Cold War related that you brought back to the States? So my, so the thing I've, so I've got a bookshelf here behind my desk, which I'm standing here <laughs> looking at right now. The thing I've got that probably is the most valued memento from that period of time. So, so one thing we haven't talked about, but so, so every year, so the, so these missiles were incredibly complex and lots of parts and, you know, you'd put them together and, and we never really had a chance to go test them. Right. I mean, if you were a regular artillery guy, you'd go to the range, you know, every three months and you'd, you know, you shoot you know, artillery rounds, Well, we never really had a chance to do that. So what they would do would be once a year, there would be a firing battery selected to take apart all their stuff, box it up, fly to Cape Canaveral, put it all together and launch their missiles. And so I got to do that once. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and that was part of that whole evaluation process. Because, I mean, when we, I mean, they would literally, they'd come in and they would lock you down. They would tag everything. They would watch you take everything apart. So then you'd have to put it back together the way you had it put back together, the way you had it put, put together in Germany. You'd put it back together exactly that way at Cape Canaveral. And you'd go out there on the, the launch pads where they launched the space shuttle from and, you know, all the Apollo missions and such. And we'd, we'd put together our missiles and we'd launch them and hopefully they all worked. And so I had a chance to do that while I was there. Um, our, our missiles worked. So, but, but I've got a picture that was signed by the commanding general of, of our, of our, uh, division um with a picture of my missile being launched and it's an autographed picture from the general and that that's 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 quite a prized possession for me because that was just i mean that's sort of the culmination of all of those experiences is to, to actually get the chance to go back and really launch your missiles that's fantastic what a great great memento and you mentioned that you're standing in front of your bookshelf and that raises another question are there any books in particular that you would recommend uh, related to your experience in the Cold War that would give readers a good sense of what it would be like for an American serviceman to be on the front lines in Germany at that time? You know, I've, you, you sent the list of questions and I, and I, uh, and I don't, I don't honestly have any, I've got all kinds of books here that from, from my military experiences, just mostly school books from, from military schools, but, but I don't, you know, I, I, there's not really, I think the Pershing, to missile system. I mean, I, I don't know how much people really know about it. It was very short lived. I mean, frankly, I got to Germany in February of 85. And in April, we drove up to Frankfurt and we picked up all of our brand new stuff. And I left there in February of 88. And by April, May, they were turning it all in. So, I mean, it accomplished the objective, you know, the, we brought an end to the Cold War, but it was a very short lived weapon system. And so, you know, frankly, I think your average person isn't even, doesn't even have awareness of its existence. Uh, and mm -hmm. so there's really not a lot out there um, that specifically speaks to the weapon mm -hmm. system with which I worked um, uh, or a really good, and I, I haven't really found a lot of really great representations of even what we were doing over there. 
Got it. Interesting. So last question for you, Scott, before we finish up. And by the way, this has been just a fantastic discussion, and I, I can't thank you enough. I know that the listeners are going to really enjoy what you've been able to share with us today. But if you were to be hosting a get-together, a Cold War get-together, are there any personalities from the Cold War period, either living or who are no longer with us, that you'd like to invite? Well, President Reagan, of course. I mm-hmm. mean, right? Um, but, but, but you know, the other – I've thought about that. And, you know, there were – this may seem very simple, but there were a lot of people that I met and worked with and had very close relationships during the three-plus years – I was over in Germany that, you know, whether it was my first boss I had, uh, the first, I mean, the first platoon, sorry, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. So uh, the first boss I had, a guy named Major Pennington, and Major Pennington, I, I, to this day, I remember what he told me the first time I met with him, and I have used this same exact line a hundred times with people. But I, rem- I remember what he told me was he said, because I'm, you know, I'm brand new second lieutenant, right? I don't know anything. And mm-hmm. I'm put in charge of, of uh, you know, controlling these missiles, right? And I've got a small group of people to work for me. And he, he says to me, he says, you know, Scott, he says, you can make as many mistakes as you want. Just don't make them twice. And that, that has stayed with me forever. And, I, and I've told that to people so many times. So, so there's a guy that I haven't seen him since you know, he left the unit, you know, in 1986. You know, and I would love to, to catch up with him. You know, my first platoon sergeant. So, again, you know, you're – brand new second lieutenant, right? You don't know anything. And you've got a platoon sergeant who's this you know, grizzled old guy who's been around for 20 years. <laughs> well, and in this case, so this is, if you think about it, so this is in 1985. So you still got some guys that are leftovers from the Vietnam War. So so these are guys who, I mean, some of them had really seen some stuff, you know, and, yeah. and, and some of them didn't have the time of day for a second lieutenant. Some of them would take you under their wing and, and really help you know, nurture you and, and help you really learn how to be a leader because it's a very difficult position to be in, to be a 22 year old second lieutenant, 23 year old second lieutenant. And, you know, you're responsible for leading these people who, you know, in some cases could be, you know, the age of your father and have, you know, 20 years of experience in the military. So, you, you know, it's a, it's a balance of learning that. Um, sergeant First Class Needham was my very first platoon sergeant. This guy had been a Vietnam uh, era veteran, had actually been a tunnel rat. And if you know what mm-hmm. that means, that's some crazy yeah. stuff, right? He, he's yeah. a little short, scrawny guy, and he'd been a tunnel rat in Vietnam. And so this guy had like seen a lot of stuff. And I remember so he was my first platoon sergeant, and I'd love to see him again because he, he had such an impact on me and just helping to, to nurture me and figure out how not to screw up, you know, and, and because you have a lot of opportunities to really screw up when you're brand new and, 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 you know, and you make mistakes, right? You learn and they try to coach you and manage you. But just you know, some of those people that, you know, I spent 28 years in the military, and those first three years I spent in Germany, you know, were significantly influential on my my career and just helping me learn how to be a leader. And some of those guys that influenced my career that you know I've lost track of and I haven't seen for you know 30 years, I'd love to have a chance to sit back down with them and just let them know what an impact they made on me because they, they you know they really were impactful. And it's you know it's a short window of time, right? Because you, yeah. you know I was there for three years and I had three different jobs in my battalion, so so I had the same group of folks I would work with for you know just a handful of months or maybe a year. And then they would move on or you would move on. And, and, and so, so, but during that short window of time where they've got the ability to really influence you, I mean, it's, 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 it's really important that, that the, the impact they make. And I, and I've always told people that, you know, you should always, you know, every leader for whom you've ever worked, you need to learn something from them, whether they're a good leader or a bad leader, learn something from them, which will help influence your career and how you lead people either to tell you, I don't want to be like that, or I do want to be like that. So there were some people that just really influenced my career and my style that I'd, that I'd love to reconnect with. Uh, I think those are some really great choices. And just before we finish off, Scott, uh, one question, because this sort of jogged uh, as you were talking about some of the individuals you had the privilege of working with in Germany. After the Cold War ended and after your military service ended, or even perhaps during the military service, did you ever encounter people from the other side, uh, perhaps from the former East Germany or from any of the East Bloc countries that served in the military so that you might have been able to compare notes? I never have. That's a great question. That's a very interesting question. I frankly, I've never even thought about that. But, but no, I really never have because you know, when, when, when I left there, you know, we were still three, four months from um, – 
you know, the, the treaty being signed off and the Cold War coming to an end and all of our system, weapon systems being turned in. So so they were still the bad guys when I left there. Uh, and, and I came back and I, you know, I stayed in the military, um, but never really had an opportunity to, to meet or interact with anybody that was, uh, you know, that was one of the bad guys at the time I was over there. No, that would be very interesting. It would, yeah. We really appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast, and we look forward to future conversations. Um, I'm, I'm happy to participate. It really helped to rekindle some really, really great memories and some really, really great thoughts. So I'm, I'm happy to do so. Thanks very much. All right. And we have further photos, videos, and information on this episode in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get one of those Cold War Conversations coasters, help keep us on the air, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And if you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.